Welcome to the Free From Wall Street Podcast, where we share how we have done over $200 million in real estate deals to create, preserve, and pass on generational wealth without the roller coaster ride of the stock market. If you're ready to start investing with purpose, visit freefromwallstreet.com. But for now, let's dive into this episode. Welcome back to the Free From Wall Street Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Libman, and today's the first day of school. The kids got dressed. They left the house. It's been super quiet in here all day. My wife has been homeschooling for uh, years, so this was their first day back to school. We got some big balloons and flowers. and Anyway, exciting stuff, so we've been praying for them today to have a great day. So today i want to chat a little bit about this inflation reduction act I'm not going to get political on you so regardless of kind of how you feel about politics i just want to point out a couple of things that i think were important that were discussed that may affect the industry some things like that right so number one they tried to close the what they call carried interest quote loophole i love when people use the word loophole by the way in regards to taxes because that's just what the tax code says. So it's like giving somebody a rule book and then when they follow the rules, tell them that they're cheating. It's ridiculous and it's political and I, I just can't stand it because there are no loopholes. It's whatever the Senate and the Congress agree on that the IRS should enforce is what the tax code is made of. That said, the carried interest loophole, as they call it, is basically how hedge fund managers and private equity managers get taxed at a lower rate than what ordinary income is, right? So if you're paying ordinary income, it kind of tops out at 37%. Carried interest is topped out around 23.5% because if you, because you don't pay along the way and then you pay at a capital event, so it becomes long-term capital gains. So that is carried interest and that they were trying to take that away in this last bill that just got passed. And Senator Sinema has been taking a lot of heat from Arizona because she did not allow that to go through. What they did instead was they changed the carried interest tax to being abolished to a new tax on stock buybacks for corporations. So now that's taxed in a different way. The carried interest was gonna create about 14 billion in additional tax revenue. The sale tax on stock buybacks is gonna produce about 78 billion. So, you know, whether you argue that that is better or worse, I was playing golf with some guys yesterday and they said, well, they could have done both. And that's neither here nor there. That's actually what happened. So the carried interest continues. And I had some clients asking us about, hey, what, what happens as, you know, if they close this carried interest? issue. And it would have affected them, I believe, especially if they're in general partnership positions, right, which we are as investors and operators. So it would have affected us. So anyway, the senator from Arizona, everybody's asking why she went to bat for Wall Street, essentially. And, you know, I think it's an interesting conversation because you can go to opensecrets.org, right, and see who all the major donors are. And it's interesting that a ton of the Senate and Congress gets funded by companies like Blackstone and, you know, Fidelity Management and all these big companies that get paid carried interest, right? So they've been trying to close this, this carried interest loophole for years, right? Decades. It's always on the chopping block. It is the Freddy Krueger of tax loopholes. It's not going to get changed because private equity has a significant portion to do with how the economy works, right? So I just read an article from Barron's regarding this particular subject. And economics professor from Columbia said, you know, you can't have these companies do what they've been doing very well, which is private equity investment into smaller and mid-sized corporations, and then tax them heavily, right? You, you have to allow the free market to kind of do what it does. You know, the quote from him is private equity firms keep our capital markets running efficiently by supplying so much investment capital for worthy projects that might have never been launched if private equity did not serve as an investor. It would not be wise to take steps to discourage the firms to continue to do what they've been doing for so long, right? 
This comes from this idea that taxing certain corporations or people that are making a certain amount of money is going to solve the problem. For instance, this carried interest would have created 14 billion in tax revenue on a $789 billion spending bill. So how much of an impact would it have actually made? It, it just, it becomes this us versus them mentality of, you know, let's tax the rich, the quote, fair share, right? And this is an interesting conversation because everybody plays by the same rules. Now you may be ignorant to the rules, but that doesn't mean that you're not playing by the same set of rules, right? It just means you don't know them. And frankly, I didn't for a long time until I read a great book, They Can Grow Rich, and, or uh, I'm sorry, Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. And I know you guys have heard me talk about this a lot, and I, I think it's an important, I think it's an important message to get out there that the tax code is the same for everybody. Whether or not you use it or not is up to you, right? If you have a W-2 high paying job and you're taxed at the highest tax rate, then that's on you, right? If you start a business and you take the risk and you get some tax benefits, that's on you as well. So look, I, I find it interesting because what else this professor said in this Barron's article from Columbia, who said, you know, the private equity industry it fuels a lot of businesses. He actually said also gives pensions their highest rates of return which leads me to my next topic, which is the crumbling pension system in the United States, right? So the California pen, uh, public pension system is the largest investor in the world. I don't know if you guys knew that. They took a $29 billion loss last quarter, right? So we know the stock market's volatile, but they lost $29 billion. Here's what this article says about their $29 billion loss. The fiscal watchdogs have been warning about this for more than 40 years, only to be ignored by our elected leadership, whose cozy relations with public sector unions make even modest pension reform nearly impossible. The pension reform that they're discussing is the fact that CalPERS, P-E-R-S, which is the pension system of California, is telling people not to be alarmed, like, hey, don't worry about it. And... They're saying that this, you know, six or seven percent decline is a quote <laughs> varied performance indicator. Well, yeah, I would say it's varied performance. What does that mean for people that are in the California state pension system? Not much, actually, because the way that the California pension system is written is that if the pension system is does not have sufficient funds to cover benefits, the taxpayers have to pay it. Right, so private sector employees that are self-employed, right, we're watching our own retirement portfolios shrink, but now they also have to worry about higher taxes to cover losses of public pension funds. Insanity, right? So you can't have this, this fiscal reform until these guys get their hands out of their pockets. So very interesting. I have a Google alert on pensions because I'm always interested to see how are pensions working during these volatile markets. And what does that mean for retirees? I didn't know that the taxpayers were on the hook if they couldn't fund their own liabilities. So they said that before the, this $29 billion loss, it was 80% funded, which means that they've been taking in money to pay people their retirement pensions, and then they have lost about 20% of it over the time that they've started collecting it, right? So 80% funded. Now it's down to 72% funded and the risk is really on the taxpayer not even the the retirees or the companies that they're investing into you know there's a ton of articles out there if you read about like the people that go out and wine and dine the people that make the decisions to invest into these large you know the, the pension funds go and invest into private equity they can invest in real estate they invest in all, all kinds of stuff Here's a great quote regarding how their real estate portfolio has done, right? So overall, the hit to the system's portfolio of investments was a 6.1% decline for the fiscal year that ended June 30th. Stocks and bonds took the biggest hit while its real estate holdings actually gained, helping to avoid an even greater loss. So just another factual point here that why we invest in real estate and not stocks and bonds is the same reason that the California pension system didn't lose more than that $29 billion that they lost. Anyway, I think it's important at the very least to stay updated on what governments are doing because it affects how wealth is created, right? And the tax code is specifically written in a way to help 
economies flourish. Typically, that's through investment and that is through uh, building businesses. So they get tax breaks for doing that, right? They also take the largest risks. The other side of the coin is, you know, when you see the Inflation Reduction Act come through and it's not geared towards inflation at all, frankly, it's geared towards climate change and some other uh, types of things. And if you're for that, great. If you're not, fine, but that's just what it is, right? And that's what we wanna talk about on this show is what is actually happening. Now, 87,000 new IRS agents are going to be hired. Why do you think they're doing that? So I just think logically, right? If there's um, seven, I think there's 700 billionaires in the United States and the platform is that they're only going after the 1% of the United States to get them to pay the quote their fair share. What do you need 87,000 new IRS agents for? I posted an article the other day that I read nine out of 10 of the highest audited counties in the country are in Mississippi. Do you know what the poorest state in the country is? Mississippi. Why is the IRS auditing? The most audited county, by the way, is where the median income last year was $24,000 and they had the most audits in the country. So anyway, 87,000 new IRS agents to go after less than a thousand billionaires. The math does not add up. So small businesses need to start, if they haven't already, start putting money aside to hire bigger, more staffed, more legalistic CPA firms because they're not just going after the billionaires, right? This, when they have spending sprees, the government doesn't make money. Like it's, I know it's interesting that we even have to point that out, but sometimes I think that we do because they think that the government is making money somehow and then doling it out. Tax revenue is the only way that the government makes money. 87,000 new IRS agents to go after tax revenue is how they make money, right? So anyway, if you're playing by the by the rules, right? And I, I always hear the argument, well, the IRS tax rules are so insanely complicated. Well, that's true, right? And that's why you need to get experts on your team, right? We, we work with uh, CLA, Clifton Larson Allen. They're 8,000 strong. They have 7,900 employees. Many of them are not just accountants, but many of them are attorneys as well. And that's because they that's all they do. They spend the time in the tax code and it's ever changing. And you need to be on top of that as a business owner to figure out. So if you're a small mom and pop bakery, what are you going to do? Right. You're going to go out and hire a Clifton Larson Allen. Like, I don't think so. Right. I mean, you, but you have to find professionals that are affordable for your business and start putting money away as part of operational expenses for those types of professionals on your team. Because when things change, that's how you get caught with the dumb tax of ignorance, right? Which is you just don't know what's going on. So anyway, a lot of political type conversation today, but I hope it wasn't. It's just telling you guys what is going on that I think is affecting industry and what will affect economics. You know, on the other side of that is interest rates continue to get hiked, right? The Fed is trying to battle inflation because just supply and demand issues, right? So how do you curb inflation? You raise interest rates. Interest rates have gone up by 2.25% so far this year. It's August, 2022. So that means we should have another rate hike here next month. And they're predicting another 0.75 increase. So that'd be three points in 10 months, which essentially curbs buying power by about 30%. And that's how they try to rein in inflation. Assuming, assuming the government doesn't create more inflation with their type of spending and printing money that comes from that's that's how inflation is created if you don't know feel free to look it up this is just econ 101 so when there's too much supply of capital that's where inflation comes from so they're trying to constrain that capital by decreasing buying power and it's interesting because the fed is part of the government but it is, it, it appears that they're working against each other at this season in time this juncture if you will so anyway stay alert out there read be aware of what's happening so you don't get caught with your pants down and thank you once again for listening to free from wall street if you guys are finding value just if you could like this, share it, leave us a review if you like it or not. All right. Thanks for tuning in. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Free From Wall Street podcast. If you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review and let us know what you think. 